All right, so uh, my talk today is Moneyball for Performance Metrics. Um, my name's Jeff. I'm a web developer at NPM. Um, I write, as you can imagine then, a lot of JavaScript, but also CSS and HTML. Um, but today is a free time topic, or a hobby topic, and uh, that is sports. Um, I'm actually a really, really big fan of baseball. Um, so. I don't know how much of the crowd is really into baseball, but I'll keep the sports metaphors down as low as possible. But um, baseball is a super interesting sport to me because I grew up near Seattle and live in Seattle, um, which makes my team the Seattle Mariners. Uh, and that isn't necessarily a great team to be a fan of if you follow baseball, um, because they're historically one of the worst teams of all time. Um, it's it, like they've never, it's not that they've never won a World Series, uh, which is the US baseball championship. Um, they've never actually even been to it. Uh, it's heartbreaking year after year. Um, and while I could spend like all of my time up here discussing the lifetime of disappointment that I've had being a fan of this team, um, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'll discuss some of the better baseball that I've ever seen in my life, um, which of course was played by a totally different team. So let's talk about a division rival, the Oakland A's. Um, so in 2002, there's a man named Billy Bean, and he was the general manager for the Oakland Athletics. And they're a professional baseball team located in Oakland, California. Now, Oakland has a disadvantage, as far as teams go, of being what's called a small market team. And this means that the team, normally due to location, doesn't have as big of a fan base as you know, some of the bigger teams would. And that means that they can't really generate the money that's needed to bring in some of the bigger name players. Now, in baseball, the general manager of a team controls all the contracts, the hiring, and the firing of players. Um, and since he was the GM of a small market team, Billy Bean had the difficult challenge of attracting big name players um, and hugely talented players to his team um, because he couldn't pay them as much as one of the big popular teams would be, say, the New York Yankees. Um, side note. Uh, whatever you know about baseball, as little or as much as possible. If you can take one thing away from this talk, let it be that the Yankees suck. Okay, so <laughs> fortunately uh, for the A's, uh, Billy came up with a plan. He decided that the traditional ways uh, of measuring the quality of a player did not paint the entire picture. And they weren't helpful for building a winning baseball team, especially in the case of a team that couldn't afford to pay the biggest players the most amount of money. Billy instead used newer aggregated statistics and formulas to put together a list of players who then um, were, could be measured against these new metrics. And these metrics became far more valuable for these players uh, because it could make it so Billy could get cheaper players who would win better games. Um, this is actually one of those formulas. You saw the like, early statistics. Uh, this, this is one of those big formulas. It's for one called on-base plus slugging percentage, which I will not explain here today. So the strategy ended up being very successful, and it brought the A's to the playoffs multiple times in a row. Uh, and it comp made them compete on the same level as the teams who spent more than double the amount of money. Um, and this new strategy, it spread throughout the league and it became really, really famous, and there was a book named after it, and there was even a movie uh, made after it, and it starred Brad Pitt, and if Brad Pitt plays you in a movie, you've done a pretty good job, probably. Um, so we're here at DevFest Asia, which is really beautiful, thank you, uh, and uh, I'm up here and I'm babbling about baseball and why, and it's probably because I could talk at all of you about baseball all day long, um, but also I think that Billy's ideas can be applied to all sorts of other fields. Um, so traditional tactics for measurement, uh, they need to be reanalyzed from time to time. Uh, they need to be tested against new metrics to get a better idea of how things actually work. I think this is especially true for one of my other great interests in life, which is web performance. We've spent a very long time focused on a few key indicators that tell us how fast our sites are. Um, but it's become pretty clear lately that that only paints half the picture. So picture me for a minute like I'm the web version of Billy Bean, which should be super easy for you. 
uh, especially if you're in the really, really far back. OK, so let's talk about websites. To find out where we can start, we have to know what we're up against. Um, we have to know and understand the enemies at play here. And the enemies in this case are the things that make up a slow-ass website, because slow-ass websites lose. Um, so what are we up against? Let's take a look at what hell means for a web developer. So the state of JavaScript in Android is really, really poor. And seriously, Android devices get a lot of heat for lagging on performance, and they should. Um, but it's not just Android that is killing us out there on performance. It's kind of all of those little pocket computers. We have a ton of them, uh, and they've taken over. Um, this chart right here is the, the, the orange, is the growth in data uh, usage um, over the last five years for mobile devices. Uh, the overall growth of mobile device use for browsing isn't something new. Uh, responsive design has been the way for about five years now. And in 2013, actually, 21% uh, of all cell phone owners used their phone as their primary device for internet access. And this number's only been increasing as the years go on. And we don't just assume they'll do things with their devices while they're like on the go. This mobile context thing turns out to be mostly bullshit. But we know they'll do basically anything on them. Um, dog sitting, dating, making terrible comments on YouTube, buying food, buying a car, buying a house. Um, we, so we, we have these devices that everybody uses, and we're, we're kind of stuck with the fact that they do that. Uh, but we have the knowledge that they're going to be used everywhere, consistently, for some generally weird stuff from time to time. But you know, they're, they're super convenient, so who cares if they're fast? Well, it turns out basically everybody. Uh, people expect mobile to be fast and will punish you for not making it so. Uh, example, uh, Etsy increased the kilobytes of images on their page by 160 kilobytes. That's not a lot. Uh, and it, in, it ended in a 12% increase in bounce rate for their site. Um, Edmonds, on the other hand, lowered their load time by 77% and got 20% more page views and a 4% drop in bounce rate and 3% drop in ad impression variance. And as you might, like, so those are good examples there. And as you might have experienced, getting your site to be fast on mobile is really kind of difficult. Mobile traffic is, by default, not very fast. And latency on a bad network can bite you really, really hard. And it's rarely the case that somebody has access to a network where latency isn't an issue. Example given, more people access Facebook over 2G than 4G. This probably isn't that surprising to a lot of the crowd. Um, and that's where winning and losing comes into play. Uh, what do I mean by winning and losing? Let's talk more numbers. Edom dropped their load time from 1.2 seconds to 500 milliseconds. This dropped, or this increased the time people spent on the site by 21%. It increased their conversions by 20%. And it increased the amount of page views visited by person 28%. Walmart dropped their load time by one second, just one second, and it increased 2% of conversions. Um, and they found that for every 100 millisecond load time they dropped after that, they increased their revenue by 1%. And if you have any concept of how much shit Walmart sells, a 1% increase in revenue is really, really, really high. Obama for America during his last campaign dropped load time by 60%. And that increased conversions by 14%, conversions in this case being donations. Um, in the US, if you have the most amount of donations, you tend to win the presidency. So that's probably pretty important. And I could do this all day. No, I mean, seriously, we could be here for a really long while if I keep at this. There are a plethora of performance-related stories out there for you to convince the people who have all the money in your company that you need to work on this stuff. Uh, example again. Removing one client-side redirect from Google's DoubleClick resulted in a 12% improvement in click-through rate. Amazon sees a 1% decrease in revenue for every time they hit a 100 millisecond increase in load time. A one-second delay for Bing turns into a 2.8% drop in revenue. Two-second delay, 4.3% drop. 
Mozilla cut their load time by 2.2 seconds and saw download conversions increase by 15.4%. And so we have all this knowledge. We, we know that sites need to be faster um, and the benefits of that. But at the same time, um, features, frameworks, new designs, et cetera, they're bloating up our sites. The average size of a website now is around 2.14 megabytes, which is a 12% or 12.7% growth over just last year. So we have an increasing use of underpowered devices on shaky networks, and those users are being delivered bigger websites all the time. These same users are growing less and less patient over time with how slow our websites are. How are we supposed to make a good experience happen? Well, my favorite way to handle problems is to find definitive ways to measure those problems and then focus on improving those measurements. We need to find out what we want and find different ways of gathering quantitative values by which we can solve this problem. So there's actually kind of a big warning about this, though. Just because something is difficult to measure does not mean it should be disregarded. If you find something nearly impossible to measure, keep it in mind at all times. Trying to approach it from other angles, um, it's good. You can make it part of other measurements if, you, if it can't be broken out just by itself yet. And Daniel Yankelevich, which is who's this guy right here, he had a great quote about this. The first step is to measure whatever can be easily measured. This is OK as far as it goes. The second step is to disregard that which can't be easily measured or to give it an arbitrary quantitative value. This is artificial and misleading. The third step is to presume that what can't be measured easily really isn't important. This is blindness. The fourth step is to say that what can't be easily measured really doesn't exist. This is gross negligence. So keeping that in mind, we've been using easy measurements for a while. And what are those traditional measurements we've been using? DOM complete? So, DOM complete is when a document object model tree has been completely built. This is frequently known in the point in time in which you can query for elements. And that's good. You should definitely know that part of your page. Um, or the load event. On load is the point in time in which every single asset on the site has been loaded. And page weight. Page weight is the size of everything the client ends up downloading to make the site work and it's all summed together. Um, the request to response timing. So the request response timing is the amount of time from when your server receives the HTTP request until the time where it responds. And that's fully encapsulated within the server, no latency taken into account there. And there are plenty of options available for backend measurement that I've had good experience with, um, these three in particular. So those measurements combined, uh, they can paint a bit part of the picture for us. But if you only pay attention to them because they're easy to track, you're missing out on crucial pieces of performance. And this can absolutely sink you. Don't get me wrong, these metrics are useful and I actually pay attention to them, but they're just part of what we're looking for when we're trying to measure speed. So what's the new way? What's the new strategy? How do we fill in the blank spaces that our traditional measurements leave behind? How do we find the best way to give our users what they want in the way we want to give it to them and as quickly as possible? Well, that answer is kind of complicated. But it sums up as we need to focus on the first usable time. If instead of monitoring how long it takes for the entire page to load, we instead measure how long it takes for the user to use the page for what they want to use it for, we can get a more accurate gauge on general usability. Because it's incredibly frustrating to get to a page that clearly has all the content downloaded, but the text is blank until the font loads. This is the New York Times yesterday on Chrome. Note how I can't read the headlines. And it's incredibly frustrated to get to a page that looks visually complete but has so many different scripts on it that you can't even interact with it. So what kinds of things are people using now to find out if their site is usable? I'd say the most popular measurement right now, um, newer one at least, is speed index. Uh, Speed Index was invented by the fine folks who bring you Web Page Test, which is a fantastic tool that allows you to see video strips of your site and how it loads. 
You can break it down to the tenth of a second, and for those of us who like to nerd out about this kind of stuff, you can roll through and really see how the browser puts your page together. It's a fantastic tool. I strongly recommend using it, and maybe even buying the book about using it. Anyway, the speed index metric is based upon visual completeness and how quickly your site can get there. So let's talk about the formula. It, the speed index is calculated as an integral of zero to end, which is recorded in milliseconds, of one minus the visual completion percentage divided by 100. So um, if integrals and calculus were not your strong suit, let's talk about this in the form of a chart. With visual progress being on the y-axis and time being on the x, the shaded area here is the part of your page that is visually incomplete. You can tell right here that it eventually approaches zero. This gives you something measurable, and you can use web, the web page test API to run several tests against your page and return median results, which is something you can use as a benchmark to make sure you're not having serious performance regressions. Uh, this example here is the NPM website. It loads its content right there, so you can see how it looks visually by tenth of a second. And Speed index isn't brand new, but it's become accepted as another reliable data point to track. That gets not just accepted, it's suggested by Google, and it's a fan favorite amongst the performance crowd. So this is a great data point to add to those ones I mentioned before. Um, somebody else has made it easy for you to measure, which is good. It gives you a legitimate target to optimize for, but what about when it doesn't capture quite what you need? What if, it's a detect what if its detector for visual completeness is actually way off? That happens from time to time. But what else can we measure? How about the time it take, or how about the time you take while blocking rendering? Like, lowering this is the first key to making sure your users' browsers are able to start as soon as they can on rendering your page. So how do we do that? You start by finding the files which are blocking rendering. These include any CSS on your page, and also any JavaScript that executes before the content does. Once you've found these, you can use your network tab and your dev tools to read the total time you spent downloading these files. But that's not necessarily sustainable for automating this process. So let's have PhantomJS do it. Do you know you can use PhantomJS to write HAR files? OK, so in case you don't know what a HAR file is, HAR file stands for HTTP archive file. They can be used to demonstrate the network traffic and assets loaded when visiting a page, just like what the network tab will give you. OK, so back to Phantom. By timing each asset's request response cycle, including start time and time and the size of the files, you can do exactly what the network tab does. In this case, I ran a script that created a HAR file, which is in JSON format. And then I opened it in Charles to inspect it. So you could get a good breakdown of how all of that stuff works and how it all looks, and you can have it automatically produced. Um, and that's fantastic and useful, but what else? How many round trips does it take to view your content? Is it over one? Let's talk about how that works. So when you have a new HTTP request, there's a thing out there, uh, you use TCP to connect. Now, did you know that TCP connections cannot use the full bandwidth available to them. In order to prevent dropped packets, TCP starts slow. As it doesn't know the quality of the network, it's sending data over and wants to avoid congestion of that network. Therefore, it's a standard to send, at a maximum, 10 TCP packets on a new connection for its first round trip. At 1,500 bytes per packet, that's only 14.65 kilobytes. At this point, the client sends an acknowledgment that it has received the data and it sends it to the server, so it will send more. The server will slowly ramp up the amount that it sends with each trip. But this can take a bit if you've got a huge first file you're sending. So uh, in this example here, you just like jump left to right. The client says, hey, I'd like you know, to visit this page. The server gives back that first 14.65K. The client says, I've got it. So the server starts ramping up how much it can send, with the client acknowledging each time how much that it received it. So what does this actually mean for you in practice? If you can keep all of what is needed to use the site out of the gates in one request, 
lower than or equal to 14.648 kilobytes, you're cutting the amount of round trips that need to happen for your site to be usable in an incredibly fast speed. Even over high latency and low bandwidth networks, th this will feel snappy. What else can we measure? What about timing differences on every event under the sun? Have you used the performance timing API before? Okay. It's awesome, so let, let's do this. We'll bring PhantomJS back out. I can automate running this, performance.timing.loadEventEnd minus performance.timing.navigationStart. Uh, what this does is it gives you the time in milliseconds from the moment the browser starts the process of navigation to your page to the moment it's finished loading the page. This is far more exact than anything onload could ever give you. So, and it's really useful. This, will, this right here, performance.timing.dominteractive minus performance.timing.responseStart. This will give you the time from the moment where your server response comes back to your browser until the time where the browser has finished parsing all of the HTML and DOM construction is now complete. Are those not exact enough? Here are all the options available for timing. For almost every measured point here, you can record and report back your data. This should push you along nicely to having your own real-time user monitoring. But sometimes things aren't so cut and dry. And this is where a big caveat comes in in all this. You can come up with all of your own statistics and all of your own monitoring, but different websites need different measurements. And it's great to line up your sites and compete over median speed indexes and page weights and load times. And seriously, competing over that stuff makes a better web for all of us. But what if your page cannot possibly be considered complete until the hero image is loaded? What if you couldn't even think of, your page, of using your page until your menu can not only be clicked on, but it can be used as well? And this is where we end up building something of our own. We can have all these well-vetted formulas and ways to approach performance out there, but to really approach our problems at their source, we need something that fits our own personal sites. For that, we're going to need real-time user monitoring. And we're also going to need some custom metrics. Luckily, we've got those. They're the user timing API. The user timing API is still in recommended status by the W3C, and it's not used by Safari yet, including iOS or Opera Mini. But there's a perfectly good polyfill out there for this. So let's get going. The user timing API provides a couple of really good methods that can help us better track what's going on on our page. They attach right to the performance interface. These methods include mark, which allows you to take a quick time snapshot that is saved, and measure, which will give you a measurement between two marks. With these, you can very accurately time what's happening and just how long it takes for these things to happen. So let's use an example. Say I have a page that isn't considered ready until this image itself is front and center. Now, with a regular performance timing API, I, can, I have the ability to grab the file that was requested, and it can tell you how long it takes to get the file with get entries by name, and then I can just check the duration of that. But that's not the whole story to the file. We need to see when it actually shows up. So for that, we can borrow a little trick that Steve Souders came up with and combine a few different methods for marking. We can start with an inline load. Oh, man, I always wanted to use the laser pointer on this. Uh, <laughs> inline onload on the image itself. And then we can also put an inline script right behind the image tag so it will execute while the page is being rendered. Then we can check the start time, what the start time is for each of these marks. The highest in this case will give us the actual time that the image has been rendered on the page. This is immensely useful for a hero image or for an image that the page actually relies upon to be considered usable, such as if you're, you have a site where people are buying things and they need to see the picture to be able to use the page. That's pretty neat, huh? So hopefully you have an idea of something in your head that you can measure that will dramatically increase the actual visibility you have into your site's performance. But never be satisfied with just those measurements. New techniques will continue to be developed, and with them will come better insight along the way. So pay attention to your statistics and test across the board, and you should have a lot of success. And then you can dance. So now what? Now that you have your own measurements in order, maybe we can focus on what we need to do to speed things up a bit. 
So latency is a big one. Latency is the amount of time it takes for your request to make it from the client to the server. The transmission is limited by, first, the speed of light, but then the resistance provided by the copper used in the wire and the path taken from routing station to routing station for these HTTP requests. Since the path is such a factor in this case, using a CDN can greatly limit the amount of latency your users uh, incur by shortening the distance that the request has to go. Another way to avoid latency issues is to cater to your critical path. As I mentioned earlier, the first request makes uh, to the client, or the first request that the client makes to the server will be limited by TCP's slow start. This limit is roughly 14.6 kilobytes. With this in mind, if you can inline your CSS that is critical for the page to load and then asynchronously load your full CSS file along with any or any you know, necessary JavaScript, you can make sure little to no render blocking that relies on a network request occurs, and your first round trip will have everything a user needs to use a site. One of my favorite examples of this is the Filament Group website. In this case, I throttled the connection down to two, just to 2G, and the site was still usable in less than a second. While sending an empty body and waiting for a script to load all of your assets may feel cleaner, um, and, and certainly nice for a lot of things. It, it guarantees that there will be a minimum of two requests before you can even start building the content for your page. And once that happens, if your user has an underpowered device, then it can take even longer. And that's why server-side rendering is important. Rendering your site on the server first and sending the HTML on the first response will almost always provide a faster first page load. In the past, we've been able to achieve this with progressive enhancement, which I'm a huge advocate for. But now, JavaScript frameworks, libraries, whatever you want to call them um, in this case, they're catering to this performance necessity by allowing your first request to be served HTML. Ember does it with Fastboot. Angular 2 does it. Um, I know you can build it in with Backbone, et cetera. You can also use best practices, which I never really like that term. It tends to mean, hacks that involve tribal knowledge so we can work around limitations of our technology. Um, and with HTTP 1.1, we have a lot of those. So let's talk about why they're actually recommended instead of hand-waving around them. For example, due to the amount of concurrent requests a browser can make, six, which is a completely arbitrary number that we all, for some reason, need to memorize, um, we suggest you concatenate all of your CSS and JavaScript files so as to limit the number of requests that your browser can make without stalling. And since we're sending this big file of CSS or JavaScript, we want to make sure that we can make it as syntactically small as possible. We want to strip comments. We want to make variable names as small as possible, et cetera. Minification makes this possible by parsing your file and then recreating your code in the smallest way. Then there's gzip. I'm, I'm a huge fan of gzip. I think it's really, really great. gzip works like the video you see on the screen. It looks for repetition in the text that's being sent and writes to file something that references said repetition. If you can see the red text that's starting to pop up there, that's the part that's, rep that's repeating. So this compression process actually is really, really fast, and it makes for some immensely smaller files for transfer. So you should always gzip where you can. You'll save money on bandwidth and provide a better experience for your users. And once again, everything in the red there, that gets compressed out. So combining gzip and minification can be a huge for dropping your file size. For example, here's jQuery, dropping from 247,597 bytes to 29,607 bytes. So as I mentioned, best practices are normally artifacts that come with limitations of your current ecosystem. HTTP2 helps address these issues in a lot of ways. And best of all, you can use it right now, delivering your site based on what your client asks for. So hopefully you have some ways in your mind to measure performance on your site. With these measurements, you can concentrate on the pain points in your site by focusing on methods to speed everything up. This is great, and it's wonderful, but let's bring it down to the last part, never settling. Set a performance budget and stick to it. Know what you want your users to experience. Measure increases and decreases in your time and see how that affects your traffic, your conversions, your sales. And make sure the continuous integration system tests if your budget is being met. Here's how Etsy handles this. They keep a video showing on a big wall in their a building uh, how their site currently loads displayed front and center. Developers of the site see where their members or where their numbers currently are. So they're empowered to act upon problems and what they're building to see if their success, their success is firsthand. 
So I've talked a lot up here about how performance affects the bottom line. And I even named this talk after a baseball method of extracting the most you can out of your team without spending more money than necessary. But performance, well, web performance at least, it's, it's about more than that. Building a faster website makes for more money, sure, um, but it also increases the amount of people who can visit your site. Faster sites tend to be faster, period, all the way down. And so that makes it, your site more accessible for everybody, including everybody who has a lagging network behind them. And isn't that what the web's all about? Thanks. Thank you, Jeff, for a wonderful talk. Um, uh, uh, from, the, from my own experience about the performance API mm -hmm. by the W3C, I find the issue is whether it's really accurate for the uh, usable time. Like you add the mark in your JavaScript, but mm -hmm. in fact, uh, maybe all the time the page is still somewhat unusable. So that's uh, one issue we uh, encountered. Yeah. Yeah, no, I. Uh... I, I totally see that. And that's why, at least in the image hero part right there, I had two different marks in that piece. You'll find that the performance timing API and the user timing API occasionally need you to f figure out first what you're trying to measure. And um, so usability time is kind of arbitrary based on what your site is. And so if you can pinpoint what it is you're exactly looking for, it, it tends to be able to help um, with your accuracy. Uh, because you mentioned about the concatenating, I just wonder if it's still worth to make some things like the Facebook speak pipe. It's a legacy, maybe legacy issue that we just uh, try to optimize the loading with the several bundles in, in our JavaScript implementation. But I don't know whether if we have the HTTP2, we still need to do that. OK, so this is actually where HTTP2 comes in tremendously uh, and fantastically. So HTTP2, in case people in the crowd don't know, um, has a thing called server push, which will basically deliver your assets immediately upon visiting the site. It's pretty awesome. And uh, I'm, so you can right now, and it requires a little bit of finagling, you can, based on the header of the request, you can direct your code to say, load this stuff with HTTP 2. And if they're approaching with HTTP 1.1, shoot them this way instead. So with tooling, um, you're still concatenating as part of your build process. And you can say, I want this one file to be served in the case of HTTP 1.1. But screw it, load them all uh, if they're coming with 2, because you can have a ton of parallel requests. And they'll actually come out a lot faster that way. Hi, um, my name is Mitch. I was just wondering your idea on um, how Facebook do it, where they block a like block certain elements with kind of non-distinguished shapes, and whether that to the user is something that's feasible or not, or does it does it appear to be faster, or from the user perspective, you think it works, or like your opinions on that, basically? Um, so I, I'm. I'm actually kind of a really big fan of the idea of building things that appear to be faster, um, because that can, well, trick people into having your, uh, it, it makes it so your site is still usable in a faster fashion. Um, and in Facebook's situation there, that's what you're talking about the face image loading thing, where it like gives you, the, it, it turns out that that picture that you're first seeing there isn't necessarily what everybody's interested in right away. Uh, it feels like that would be the case, but mostly when you're looking at pictures, you're thumbing through people's shit. Um, sorry, I've cursed up here a lot today. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, so I'm, I'm an advocate for it. Uh, I work for a news agency, mm -hmm. and everything works fine till you inject the ads because the model based on ads revenue. So how do you make the performance for it? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> so performance on ads is, uh, yeah, that's, that's always difficult. Third-party JavaScript is something that it's difficult to wrap around. I, the only way that I've ever been found to, or I've ever found to make a site vastly more usable despite the ads on the page is to make sure they're lazy loaded in the most way possible. Put async 
put defer on those, and shove them at the bottom of the page. And everything else will be requested first. And when there's time, those will be requested in. Hopefully, they don't cause a reflow. That's, that's my advice for you on that one. It hurts every time a little bit. <laughs>